Okay, so this is just uh, a bit of an introduction to why we believe in the Cuban and ecological niche model of the course. I think the way we just went around the room and heard your interests, that's probably reason enough. Uh, but I wanted to give a little bit of a context to why we're, why we're working in this field. And then Richard will give a bit of a context as well, uh, more focused on the, the actual modeling uh, aspects. But essentially, when we talk about a diversity of fields, basic biology, natural history, biodiversity, conservation, all, all the, the topics you just heard amongst your colleagues, uh, a lot of those fields depend on having good information about geographic distributions of species. Not, not all, obviously, there are, there are elements of each of these fields that don't depend on distribution of information, but each of those fields is certainly enriched by having really good uh, geographic information. I'm going to give you the example of biodiversity conservation, and I'm going to show you a number of products. Uh, here's a book that summarizes biodiversity hotspots. And important bird areas in Africa and associated islands. These are just things that I found on the web. They have something in common. This is, this is an analysis of endemic bird areas in blue and protected areas on uh, frontier forests across uh, northwestern South America. Here are uh, critical areas for biodiversity conservation worldwide. Notice this distribution within Africa. Maybe you would have a different view of those priorities. What do all of those have in common? Well, they all refer to biodiversity, and they're all geographic in some sense. They distill down to being based on information on geographic distributions of species. And so my question for you is, where does that geographic information come from? Well, when we look at that, and that is summarizing some aspect of biodiversity distributions, where did that geographic information come from? And how much do you believe it? Here are the mega diverse countries, only three in Africa. Again, do you believe it? Endemic bird areas, global 200 ecosystems, biodiversity hotspots. But again, it all comes back to species. That's a hummingbird from, from the Andes of Peru. It comes back to individual species and where they are, and also where they are. So that's the question that's kind of the basis of uh, this whole week that we're going to spend together. Now, an increasingly common tendency is to say, oh, there are digital data sets out there. Here's an example where you can get digital distribution maps of important pollinator species, digital distribution maps of the birds of the Western Hemisphere, mammals of the Western Hemisphere, amphibians of the world, freshwater fishes of the United States, and so, depending on where you work, maybe you can just go to these websites and download them. And you have a nice shape file that summarizes the distribution of all those species. So here's an example. I went to that website and downloaded uh, one of the data sets. This is for a, a, uh, a toucan, okay, in the Neotropics. This is Mexico, southern Mexico, Guatemala. Uh, and the gray shading is the area that that data set said is the distribution of the species. And the white dots are actual occurrences. And what I'd like you to see is, you know, if we're, if we're standing way in the back, and if your eyes are as bad as mine are, that map is right. Wherever you see gray, pretty much, the bird is there. But when you start getting closer, you start seeing a lot of little exceptions, like big areas where the species, where no record documents the species as being present, and other areas where the species is present out 
outside of the gray shading. Now, there's a first question of what is right? What is correct? Okay? One version of correct is, well, they're in Mesoamerica, right? So in, in that sense, they're both kind of in the same place. And if I were looking from all the way back there, the coincidence is pretty good. And I'm not seeing the occurrences here or here. But at the same time, the coincidence, when I come closer, the coincidence is pretty bad. So it's very scale dependent. If I need a coarse resolution view, maybe those maps are okay. Of course, the topography of Mexico is, is very, very kind of fine grain across space. So a coarse resolution view maybe doesn't do enough if we want to plan for conservation or something like that. If we need that fine resolution view, maybe those maps, or I would say definitely those maps, are not enough. So we need to kind of produce them on our own. Just to give you a little bit more detail, uh, those maps, like this for the Tucan, are frequently derived from range maps that come with monographic treatments or field guides. And so you can, you can see there's a little map there. And so I took um, a ruler and I measured the distance from the southern tip of Greenland to the southern tip of India is 1.625 inches. Sorry about the, the non-metric system. So the actual distance on the Earth's surface is 431 million inches. And that gives us a map scale of 1 to 265 million. That's not a fine scale map that's communicating a lot of detail. In fact, the width of the line that outlines each of those countries is huge. Just the border is huge. So there's no way you can communicate detail. And what those maps that I showed you in the previous slide do is they take this and they outscale it. And they turn it into those nice rounded polygons. Okay? So what I'm after is if you need anything other than the coarsest view of species distributions, polygon-based global summaries that are not built in a customized fashion will not be enough. So that kind of takes us to why this methodology came to be. And I want you to think about biodiversity in this two-dimensional space. One is how much we know about a species, from nothing to very comprehensive. And the other dimension, sorry, the other dimension is how many species are represented at that level of knowledge. And it appears that, quite generally, the shape of this relationship is this very negative curve, which is to say, for very, very few species, do we know a lot? Thinking about Drosophila melanogens, for example, where we know its genome, we know its, its uh, protein structure, we know its epigenetics, we know its distribution, etc., etc., its physiology. Some species are a bit better known, but most species are very poorly known. So we can kind of label different places along that curve. Uh, most of the species are little or not at all known. Here in the middle, maybe we at least know the geographic distribution pretty well. But most of the species on Earth are poorly known. So for example, if we wanted to use an alternative approach to what we're going to talk to you about this week, where we would build essentially process-based models or mechanistic models, we might be able to deal with that part of the spectrum. Okay, so this is something where we have detailed physiological measurements or a detailed first principles model of the, of the likely physiology of the species. Well, those are going to be applicable to only a very small number of species because you require such detailed knowledge. 
the approaches we're going to talk about go quite a bit further. Okay? Essentially, they allow us to deal with this end of the spectrum where we know something about the geographic distribution. Okay? For described species, almost always, at least you know one place where they occur, the type of chemical. They'll always know that, but generally we do. So the idea behind this methodology from the outset was to essentially have low data requirements at the entry, at the beginning, so that, it would, so that these methodologies would be applicable to large numbers of species. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use a trick. Okay? We don't trust our geographic sampling to be comprehensive. But what we can do is we can take sampling in geography, relate it to the environments, and essentially make the supposition that the species will occur under a certain set of environments. That's where we talk about ecological niche modeling. Now Richard's going to get up and say ecological niche modeling. Because it doesn't have a team. <laughs> and I'm going to remind him that I call him Richard, and his name doesn't have a T either. Uh, that's been a fun debate that we've been having for a decade now. Uh, so, essentially, we, we find some way to infer an environmental distribution. You can call it an ecological niche, you can call it an ecological niche. It doesn't really matter. It's finding some set of environments and then seeing where are those environments manifested on a map. Okay? Now, how we do all that is pretty complex. And the species may inhabit part of its, of its footprint of its acceptable environments, but it may not inhabit all of the footprint. So I just gave you a very simple uh, summary of niche modeling, and it's going to get complex essentially from here on out. So the three people who are going to try to explain this field to you are Richard Pearson, Enrique Martinez, and me. Uh, we've been working together for a decade or so, with Enrique a bit longer. Uh, he did some, some time as a PhD student at the University of Kansas. Uh, Richard did a, P a PhD in Britain, but then a uh, postdoc at the American Museum of, uh, in New York City. And a year or so ago, I was looking at his CV, and I noticed that he put me down as a postdoc advisor. And I thought, wow, could I really claim Richard as my postdoc? And so I queried him on it, and he said, well, yeah, you can you know, help advise me to do that. I was like, okay, right away, put it on my CV. <laughs> Basically, I'm proud to have been associated with both Enrique and, and Richard over the years. And in fact, in 2011, we produced this book. Um, it was published by Princeton University Press. And it's essentially a summary of what, what we've learned together over the years uh, about this, this field. Not just niche modeling, but kind of single species distributional ecology. So, what are we trying to do this week? It's a big objective, but what we would ideally like to achieve is give you the conceptual basis and much of the empirical knowledge so that you're able to do publishable work in this field of, of ecological management. I'm hoping that we'll have a lot of discussion and debate, a lot of interchange, which is to say, please don't be shy. Please, if you have a question, ask it. And if you disagree, say so, and we'll talk about it. Um, and the other objective, of course, is, is to capture everything visually so that it's not just the 53 of us who, who can uh, see these presentations and debates. So, there, now things got bad, right? This is a figure out of chapter four of our book but then I started adding to it everything that at least I've learned in the ensuing few years. Uh,
this is kind of the framework for our whole week. And I don't put this up to, to scare you, but rather just to give you an idea of the complexity. Essentially, what it comes down to is we have to assemble occurrence data, and we have to assemble environmental data. And both of those data streams need to be processed. And in fact, they need to be processed in tandem. That's why you see this, this arrow going back and forth between the two data streams. But essentially, this is dots on a map showing where your species is known to occur. And this is maps of environmental dimensions showing what's going on in the climate land cover, what have you. Uh, by the time we get here, that's where we press the button and run an inch model, okay? We do a whole bunch of things to calibrate those models well. There's this evaluation step where basically, if we haven't tested our model to make sure that it has some predictive power, we shouldn't be interpreting it, okay? So without an evaluation step, I'm not very interested in looking at a model output. And then we can project our model onto the piece of geography that we're interested in. We can maybe be interested in other situations. A lot of you mentioned climate change. Well, this might be a guess at a future climate some other model output. And then we do a lot of interpretation. So it's quite a complex process. And certainly the three of us and a dozen colleagues around the world have been learning lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson about how to do this process better. We're going to give you our own particular view of that world. We're going to try to point you towards the most critical steps and maybe point you away from things that eat up a lot of time and aren't so critical. We'll do our best. If next week somebody says, well, aren't you doing such and such? You can blame us, okay? But we're doing our best to give you a view, a strategic view of how to get from data to usable results as robustly and as efficiently as we can. Okay. I've already shown you that, but those are all the topics we're going to try to cover. Uh, so please drink a lot of coffee or tea at each of the breaks because you're going to need it. Uh, here's again the general plan. See if you can't get here before 9 o'clock so that we can get to work right at 9 o'clock each day. Um, lectures for two hours, half hour break. At 11.30, please be ready to roll, okay? Be ready to get back to work. Hour and a half, and then an hour for lunch. Hour and a half, and then a break. And then another hour, and you'll be worn out by then, and we'll be worn out by then. And if you have any special needs of any sort, regarding diet or, or uh, schedule, just let Kate or me know and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Um, she quietly avoided the microphone when we were doing introductions. That's Kate Ingenloff. Uh, her interests so far in two years of graduate study include uh, dry land snake distributions across South America, um, albatross distributions, pelagic albatrosses in the Southern Oceans, um, braided river systems in, in glacial valleys, and we'll see what comes next. And most importantly, that's my granddaughter, uh, Kalesi. Uh, that was the best recent picture I could find of myself.